I didn't do the New Year's lesson last week. You know, I've been in this short little series, and um, although it kind of works out, it's kind of good to go through, go over the things we've been discuss- discussing over the last couple of weeks uh, as we're looking inwardly. So really quickly, just remind us that we began by looking at Asa. Remember that. We discussed how it's easier to see issues in someone else's life. But then we, we need to look in the mirror. So we were looking inwardly. And then the next week we discussed, and it was a really simple point, we have to be people that think about things. We have to be deep thinkers. We need to consider our lives. We need to consider where we're at. We got into all of that. And then the next week, that was last week, we followed it up with the Word of God. It is living it is active, it is God communicating with us, and we've got to stop looking at it as a have-to-do thing, but a get-to-do thing. It's not something we do out of obligation, and it's not just a book of laws, although it has His law in it. It is a relationship with God. And the more you believe in God, the more that that Word becomes living and active. And so you need it in all situations, right? And I wanted to end this short series with also the idea of suffering. We just had Christmas and we had New Year's, and for many of you, it was a great time. And maybe 2023 was your year. But maybe the Christmas time was extremely difficult and there were a lot of tears that were shed. Maybe you are coming off of a great year, but maybe 2024 is going to end up being very difficult for you. How will we deal with that? You know, Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, 13 said, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except for to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This is a passage, by the way, that you need to think about regularly. Matter of fact, just Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, it's just good to think about the principles uh, found in those passages, in particular Matthew chapter 5 through 7, regularly. Do you know that you bring flavor to this world? you think about that? You bring flavor to this world. Woe is any country where Christians are taken out or Christians move away. The flavor is gone. But sometimes you find yourself and you're going, you know, Lord, I hear you. I hear you on that. But I got to tell you, my life, (laughs) it's hard for me to give flavor because I've lost the flavor myself. Have you ever Have you ever noticed that in life when you're really in the thick of it, that you know what I mean by this? Life has lost its flavor. It's the most frustrating thing to have a wonderful meal in front of you and you can't even taste it, isn't it? You're like, I'm having a hard time being this to other people because I'm trying to get it back myself. It's why I like passages such as Acts chapter 5. I think I hopefully asked you to turn over there already. I'm in Acts chapter 5, and of course we've got the resurrected Lord and his disciples are on fire. They're not timid anymore. They've been out preaching. They've been out uh, doing wonderful signs. We read about how people would are even bringing their sick out, just hoping that Peter would walk by them and his shadow would be cast upon them. People are being healed. The Jewish leaders royally frustrated at this whole thing. Bring him in, have him locked up, but then God sends an angel, <laughs> lets him out. <laughs> says, get back, keep preaching the word. So whenever they call for the men, they go, they go to, the, to the jail cell and they're, they're nowhere to be found, and they go, they're out, <laughs> they're out somehow preaching. And they said, well, let's, let's get them back in. So they come back in and they're threatening them. Didn't we tell you, you know, not to preach in the name of Jesus? And I'm in Acts chapter 5, Uh, let me start in verse 40. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. You read that. These guys were beaten. They go out and they rejoice because they said, we're worthy to suffer for Jesus Christ. And it's in these moments that I lose my salt, that I go back and I go, oh, I love this. My appreciation for these disciples grows. It grows. You, you, love, you see this in a country. You know, the stories that will tell for however long God allows a country to survive. The wars they go through. They fight for freedom. The, the, the death the trials and tribulations. We do that in the physical realm. These guys for the spiritual kingdom. You love to see a group of men who were running towards the thing that most everyone runs from, suffering. Anything we can do, we try to run from it. We we draw encouragement and it stirs the soul because you see men who are finding something worthy to fight for, something that brings life back, something that brings flavor back into their life. They were rejoicing after being beaten. But I got to be honest with you, brethren, if I'm going to level with you, I don't know what that's like because I've never suffered to that degree. Would you level with me for a moment? So I still feel in some sense a little detached. I mean, it it could happen in this country. It could happen. There may be a day to where we're going to feel the whip on the back, so to speak, but not today. Let me tell you what resonates a little bit more. We're going to go back to Habakkuk. Okay, we're going back to our minor prophets, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk. In Habakkuk chapter 3, what's happened is Habakkuk is looking at his life as he knows it, his home, his environment, and he says, the people of Judah are evil, Lord. This is a hard place to be. It's a hard place to live. It's in moral decay, and I'm trying to understand, God, where are you? Where are you? Why aren't you doing anything? And God responds, and he goes, I'm here, and I'm aware, and I'm seeing and I'm sending the Chaldeans. And Habakkuk goes, well, hold, oh, hold on. The, <laughs> the Chaldeans? And God says, yes. And they're coming to get you. <laughs> they're coming for you. And it's this moment in Habakkuk chapter 3. Habakkuk accepts this. And here's his response. Verse 16. I hear and my body trembles. My lips quiver at the sound. Rottenness enters into my bones. My legs tremble beneath me. Yet I will quietly wait for the day of trouble to come upon people who invade us. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the, in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. And I love this. I want to add this in here, not gloss over it. To the choir master with stringed instruments. And I say that because what's being said is, let's get praise going. Take my words, put it in song, get your instruments out. And let's start praising God. Brother, you know what I wanted to say this morning as we go through this? There can be praise through pain. And I want to encourage you and tell you something. That this is a blessing that God offers you. And I know we don't think about it that way. But this is an absolute blessing that God offers you. He offers you an experience. He offers you a moment where you know what it's like to be hopeless and only Him can you rely on to really feel the the weight, the realities of gravity fall on your shoulders. I am not in control. 
There are things bigger than me, stronger than me. And what will I do? You can't do anything. And who will I turn to? Exactly. There, God is offering genuine moments. Do you know whenever you praise through pain, that to me has got to be one of the cleanest acts because it's not self-seeking. Now, there are many psalms where it talks about, God, I thank you for what you have done, and therefore I will act this way. And by the way, there's, there's a whole sermon in that, because how many times do I forget to thank God for delivering on the thing that I asked him for, and all of a sudden I'm moving on, and it's two weeks later, and I go, I didn't even think to pray and thank him for that. But I'm, even, I'm taking it a step up. I'm talking about in the moment for Habakkuk, there was no way out. He's not praising him because he gets what he wants. He's praising him because he says, the reality is, as bad as this is, you are still good. My feet are not slipping in you in everywhere. They're firm. You are my strength and you are my salvation. Brethren, I'm just like you. I look around. You know, I don't like, I've told you I don't like to get into politics, but I'm level with you. Yet you think I don't see what's going on in, in, in the U.S.? and the moral decay? You think I don't feel that? You, you think I don't think about our kids, or Lord willing, if they have kids, my grandchildren? You think I'm not thinking about those things? You think that doesn't upset me? But I can praise God in the midst of that, regardless of what happens. Amen? Amen? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> Paul was put in this really awkward position whenever he should have been loved and supported by brethren in Corinth. There were some false apostles, these super apostles, who were really trying to belittle and undermine Paul in his position. And he, he's been put in this awkward position uh, again, positioned where he has to defend his apostleship. And in this portion of the letter, to add on to his role in the body, he also talks about how he had been given visions. And quite frankly, superior visions. Matter of fact, and I think he's talking about himself, he talks about a man that was caught up to the third heaven of paradise. He's like, he's not even permitted to talk about what he saw. And I think what Paul's point is, I'm that guy. You want to talk about visions? I can talk about visions. There are things that I've seen that I can't even tell you about. But then you come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 7. He says, So to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Brethren, we, we need to learn how to find our therefore statement in the middle of pain. Therefore, now there's some of these things, again, that I can't relate with. When he's talking about, again, his persecutions, I want to be very fair to my brother Paul, who I plan on seeing one day. And I want to, I want to feel like I've, I've dealt with him fairly and balanced and gently. I've not, Paul, I've not experienced that one. But I know about weaknesses. I've known about insults. I've known about hardships and calamities. I know what can take away the salt of the earth. Sickness, sin, hardships, weaknesses. I know what that results in, what that looks like. Depression, anxiety, loneliness. You're speaking my language. I get that. Again, may not to the degree of everything, but I get that. Brethren, I don't know what you're going through. But I'm going to keep asking you this. In the midst of this, I'm talking about in the middle of the storm, when is the last time that you have acknowledged the grace of your God and have said, that is sufficient for me? 
And I want to be very clear, God, I am in a position of weakness right now, and I believe that you are making me stronger, and this will result in your being glorified. Well, what do I get out of it? That's the point. He gets something out of it. The question is really, do you trust him? The question really is, is his grace sufficient? And what is his grace, brethren? You, do I need to answer that? Paul knew what the grace was. But you know, some of those things, they're, they're, they're again things that I didn't have control over. I don't know what this weakness was of Paul. But let me get to the heart of the matter. Sometimes the weakness is also due to your sin. Would you agree with that? Yeah, so let's go ahead and not dodge this one. And let's go straight into Psalm 51. Got just a couple more, two more of these passages for you, and then the sermon's yours. Psalm 51. And you've got this description, this title. It's a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, and he told him, you are the man. I mean, you have sinned against God. You've taken another man's wife. And if that wasn't enough, you you had him killed. So David writes this psalm. After that happened, David wrote, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in my inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Brethren, I got a, I got a challenging question for you, and I got a challenge for you. The next time you're getting caught up in, in sin and it's stealing the saltiness in your, of your life, your light, your life, And you're in this. I'm going to ask you to do something very uncomfortable. But I want you to pray like David. And before you get to God's goodness and his mercy and his forgiveness, I want you to join me and I want you to say something like this. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. How do you think that would make God feel to hear you say that? I first of all just want to acknowledge that I am in the complete wrong. I am only sinning against you. And whatever it is that your judgment is, it is justified. Let's continue on. Verse 7, purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore me to the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Talk to the Lord, yes, and let Him know what's going on, and let Him know what you're seeking. Then I will teach your teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Of course, you know, he's praising him. <laughs> he, he's in the midst of praising him right now. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart of God you will not despise. And this ends up being the point that Paul will pounce on later on, by the way. This is, and this is how salvation works, by the way. David, so long ago, we beat up sometimes on on the Jews and their understanding of God's grace. Don't give me that. Listen to David. David was very aware of this reconciliation that's going to happen between you and I, God. I know it's not in these sacrifices. He's not saying that they weren't, that they weren't even commanded. But what he's saying is that, but what you're really looking from me, right, is not a bloody animal. 
but a broken and contrite heart. And God, I'm pouring that out to you. Brother, you know, one of the things we do whenever we sin is we hide from each other. Many times we hide from each other and we pull the old Adam and Eve and we hide in our little garden. Because we say, I I, I can't go to him now. Brethren, it is in the midst of the pit that we go to him. It is, in, it is in the midst of our envious mindset. It is in the midst of our lying. It is in the, the, the midst of the bottle. It's in the midst of the pornography. It is in the midst of the, the junk that we go to God and we can praise Him and acknowledge, I am in the wrong and I am looking to be restored. Stop running from God When you're acting so messy, start praising Him. When's the last time we've done that? And finally, i got to end with this one. Psalm 22. You want to know why the offerings weren't going to do it? Because the the blood of bulls and goats wasn't going to take care of the problem. But there would be a Lamb of God that would come one day. Amen? See, there would be a Lamb of God that would come and give us life. That would be looking for a people that would put their faith in God. A people of a broken and contrite heart and spirit. Faith in Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God looks at His Son and says, Behold, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. And I'm listening And I'm seeing him on the cross, and I hear him say, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And we've been going back for years now, Psalm 22. He quoted the beginning of Psalm 22. Can I read it quickly with you? See, this is a Psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from my words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. And you, our fathers, trusted, they trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who seek me mock me. And they make mouths at me, and they wag their heads. And he trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you've been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near, and there's none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I'm poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It's melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They, they pierce my hands and feet. I count all my, bo- my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All of you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised, listen to this, for he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. And the Hebrew writer talks about how God heard him because of his reverent cries 
And I don't believe it's just the Garden of Gethsemane. I believe it was the cross when he cried to his father. For you comes my praise in the great congregation, my vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nation shall worship before you. For the kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. And brethren, here it ends. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Prosperity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. We talk about Psalm 22. We talk about this statement that Jesus makes. And I don't think we're getting this one right, with all, with all due respect. And I get it. Why? We talk about Psalm 22 and what was Jesus doing. And we talk about how, well, he was hurting. He was, a, he was abandoned by God. And we leave it there. And then there's another group that talks about kind of a fuller picture. Well, it's not just that. There's something more to it. And we go, no, well, there's... No, there's nothing more to it. I mean, it's, it's the beginning of Psalm 22. Why have you forsaken me? You're not letting Jesus be mankind. Let me tell you, I can only speak for myself. I have no problem letting Jesus being a man. I want to make that very clear as far as my understanding of Scripture. I believe that, excuse me, I believe that when he was in the garden, he was messed up. I believe our Lord was highly, highly anxious highly anxious. I believe he felt it, and he was terrified. And you can hear him, even in chapters like John 12, him working through it. What am I supposed to say? Save me from this hour. It's for this hour that I've come. No. And I believe that like David was sitting there going, God, I'm, I'm, I'm here, and I don't know where you're at. Why have you forsaken me? And I believe on the cross, Jesus is feeling alone. But I don't believe that Jesus believed he was alone. And I know that because in John, he tells the disciples, and he even references that when he has been turned over, that they will flee. And when he's been lifted up, they will not be there, but he will not be alone because God was going to be with him. We forget that they, the main point of the Psalm 22 is that though I feel this way, it is not the reality. That's the whole point of Psalm 22. I feel abandoned. I feel like there's no way out. There's not any way out. Jesus, you're on a cross. Yet, I'm going to praise you in the midst of the congregation. I think the reason why we struggle with Psalm 22 is not because we don't understand that Jesus isn't a man, but we're not used to seeing people praise God like that in the midst of such pain. We don't see it. Who is crucified on a cross and takes the time to praise God? Jesus? Did you know, a little fun fact, that the end of Psalm 22 that he has done it is also translated, it is finished. <laughs> Do you know that a lot of people believe that whenever Jesus spoke the words, it is finished, was actually a throwback to the end of Psalm 22? I'm not going to be dogmatic, but I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not going to be surprised if that's what he did. Does that sound like Jesus to you? A man that, that, it's like, I get it. I walk in, you want to talk about depression? I felt depression. You want to talk about anxiety? I know a little something about anxiety. You want to talk about loneliness? But the one constant factor in my life, which was my father, who did not turn his face from me, 
Yeah, I praised him in that moment. Is he not worthy of it? Do you know that the New Testament uses the term fellowship in a very narrow way? And do you know that one of the ways that fellowship is understood is literally suffering? So yeah, so now after the apostles saw this, and they were threatened by the Jewish leaders, and they were beaten for it, they went out (laughs) and they rejoiced because they were worthy of suffering for the cause. So I want to, oddly enough, encourage you (laughs) with this message, and it's something that's been very helpful to me, as you can tell from my emotion this morning. Because it's taken me a a long time to get here. And some of the sweetest moments now that I have that cannot be taken away from me are those moments whenever I'm in the midst of it and I've literally been smiling through tears and saying, God, you were so good to me. So... (laughs) Sometimes we hit storms, and sometimes we can't get out of the storm. And God willing, in his time, he will say, peace be still. (laughs) But we're still walking to him. Amen? Our faith is that anchor. We drop anchor, and we go, all right, Lord, we're going to wait this out. And meanwhile, we're going to grow closer and closer together. I I hope this has been encouragement for you. Thank you so much for your attention. God bless you as you serve him and praise him through your pain. Let's stand and praise God together.